Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you wherever you are in different parts of the world. My name is Ganeat Oyeleke. I'm a gastroenterologist and hepatologist, and I'm the director of the World Gastroenterology Lagos Training Center. You're welcome to the second session of the Women in GI webinar series. I'm very happy uh, to moderate this session, and I'm highly honored. The aim of this um, Women in GI webinar series is to build an inclusive community of passionate professionals who promote involvement and advancement of women in gastroenterology. Today, we have female gastroenterologists from different parts of the world as panelists, and we also have a male allyship. Before starting, I'd like to say a happy 65th anniversary to the World Gastroenterology Organization. Now, let me introduce um, our panelists. I have Dr. Regina, Dr. Regina Ligoria. She's a gastroenterologist from the Hospital General San Juan de, de, de Dios in Guatemala. We have Dr. May Ling Perman, an associate professor and head of School of Medical Sciences, Fiji National University, Fiji. We also have Dr. Northern Tuzan. Dr. Northern is a professor of medicine at Chibadem Mehmet Ali University, Istanbul, Turkey and our male allyship, Professor Louise Lara, is a professor of clinical medicine and is a director of the eyelid transplantation program and the University Hospital Endoscopy Unit at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center in Columbus, United States of America. To the audience, kindly utilize the Q&A box for questions and comments. The questions and comments will be taken after each presentation and discussions after all the, uh, the presentations have been wrapped up. So I now start with the first speaker, Dr. Regina Ligoria. Dr. Regina, could you please start your presentation and take us through what you have? Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh... Thanks, Dr. Ganiet, for that introduction, and thanks for the, to the WGO for this invitation. I'm very honored to be here today, uh, and thanks to everybody who is logging in from many parts of the world. Uh, thanks for joining us um, on this important activity. I was very honored uh, when I was first invited to this uh, to participate in this series. I think talking about the challenges of being a female gastroenterologist is a hot topic right now, and it's very important. Uh, for us uh, as women GIs to, 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 to dive into these things that we need to, to try to get through and try to improve uh, that will make our professional um, careers well more, more fruitful. Um, when brainstorming about what we were going to talk about today with you, uh, I was very happy that this topic came up, which is what are the challenges of women gastroenterologists when seeking to be leaders in our professional societies? And uh, going through my research, I brought for you six important topics that I think we need to go through. Um, let, me, let me see if I can get my point across. Um, the first thing I think is important is that we need to figure out how to be seen uh, as, as being interested in, in having these leadership roles and as being valuable to our as societies um, as leaders. So the first thing we need to do is seek out opportunities to actively participate and contribute in our society so that we are seen as valuable members. The other part is that we need to develop programs and activities that are seen as creative and innovative so that, again, we can be seen as valuable and, and, and actual contributors to the society so that we can be taken seriously, that we're going to be good leaders. Another thing is that we need to communicate our areas of interest and expertise, including our interest in being uh, leaders of our society. Uh, we, we need to voice our appeal and our interest in having these prevalent roles because, you know, our peers are not mind readers. A lot of women, when we start, you, uh, you see classrooms today, it's 50, 60% female. And then as you dive into specialties, subspecialties, 
uh, even advanced areas of expertise in our decided profession, uh, say advanced inter interventional endoscopy, there are less and less women. So if we don't voice our interest in being leaders, um, they're not going to just automatically think of us, right? Um, the next step that we need to take in order to be, uh, to be able to achieve this is to find mentors and find partners. And here we need to look out for our male peers that can help us uh, like Dr. Lara said to us yesterday, how do you get into that voice club, you know? Uh, we need to find those uh, male colleagues that can help us kind of weave our way through the, 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 the steps that we need to take. And also female uh, partners and colleagues that have also already achieved um, these, these, uh, these roles. Right now is is a very is a very happy and exciting moment for women as leaders in societies because we have women across the board leading our, our societies. We currently have um, the AGA president is female and the president elect is also female. The president of the UEG is female. Uh, the ACG I think is 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 pioneering this. They've had about eight. I don't know. Dr. Carol Burke can correct me. I don't know if she's online. Uh, they've had about eight or nine female presidents already. And um, our WGO past president, we had the pleasure of hearing her speak in the first meeting of this Women in GI uh, series of, a couple of months ago, Dr. Naima, it was a pleasure, very inspiring to hear her speak. So I think it's an exciting time for us to be able to uh, do the work, uh, get, the, get, the, get the partnerships that we need and find our spots. Um, I, I want to summarize what we've been talking about in just three basic steps that I think is what we need in order to position ourselves as leader in society. So these are my take home messages to you today. Number one, show up, be active in your societies, be creative, be participative. The second is speak up, tell your peers that you're interested in leadership roles, voice your interests. And the third one would be pair up either with women that have already managed to get there, male colleagues that can help us get there, and younger female colleagues that might need our help also in walking this path. Um, I'm leaving for you on the screen right now my contact information in case you need to reach out. Um, thanks again to everybody for being here at the WGO, and a special thanks to all my panelists today that um, helped me develop uh, the ideas and the material um, to be able to be with you and get these points across. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Ganyat. Thank you so much, Dr. Regina, and good to see you again. Thank you. I, 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 I thought that was a really lovely and excellent presentation. And I particularly enjoyed the three points that you, the, the take home messages, uh, show up, speak up, and pair up. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a couple of questions for you. So I'll start with this, um, Dr. Regina. Is this trend to nominate or elect female gastroenterologists as board member or president of GI society a temporary trend? And will this policy fade or wane over time? What, what do you have to say? Thank you. Well, um, that's an interesting uh, question. I, I hope it's not a trend. Um, I hope it's not a fad, I think would be the correct word. I hope that since women are campaigning for all of these positions, not just in medicine, but in other areas as well, politics, you know, I hope that it's not just a fad that it's going to die out. If it's a trend that is um, merit uh, achieved, I think it's good. And I, I hope it doesn't die down. I think that more women need to to have the merits in order to ask and receive these nominations and these elections. So I think that what is more important for this, for women to be able to continue having leadership positions is that we all need to continue doing the work, you know, and merit these, these positions. Thank you very much. Um, another question is here and it's on what are the uh, difficulties or hurdles that a female gastroenterologist face when she applies for leadership in GI societies, what, what hurdles do the female gastroenterologists face? Well, um, I think that the main, the main hurdle would be being seen as interested uh, in these positions. Uh, um, I myself, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, 
but I, this, this topic appealed to me a lot because I am currently the vice president of the Guatemalan Gastroenterology Association. And um, this past term, I was the secretary. And it's the first time in history that a female has been on the board as a secretary and now as a VP. And there are rumors there that maybe maybe I'll be the first female president. I still don't know if I'm going to be campaigning for that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, let's see if I have the skills. Uh, but I think that the first thing is that maybe there aren't enough women in our societies. I mean, in my society, there are only three women uh, as members uh, in the whole country. There are only like eight or seven practicing female GIs. So one of the hurdles that I found is that they don't see you. They don't see you. Uh, maybe there's, they're, they're not aware that females aren't getting that that opportunity because they're not seen as 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 a as a as a as a big part of the population of the of the society's population. So I think being seen is something important, and that is on us. That is not on our male peers. That is on us uh, doing the work. You know, like I said before, participating, contributing, uh, being there, going to the meetings asking questions, presenting cases, publishing, you know? So I think that's probably the biggest hurdle is, is getting seen, right? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Regina. This has been very um, interesting and quite enlightening. So I'll move on to the next um, speaker, panelist, uh, Dr. Maylene Kerman. Dr. Maylene, kindly take us through uh, your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kanyet. Uh, it, it is an honor and privilege to be here. When I was asked to uh, be part of the panelists, uh, my uh, imposter syndrome just suddenly became really magnified. So uh, uh, thank you. I'm so uh, honored and privileged to be here uh, otherwise. Um, yes, so I'm uh, Mylene Perman. I'm an internal medicine physician with special interest in gastroenterology. I am from a small little uh, island in the Pacific uh, from the country of Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, I live in Fiji. So this is the picture of the, uh, you probably uh, are aware of the blue continent, but if you're not, basically that's uh, the Pacific Ocean. And we know that the, that's the third, it takes up uh, a third of the uh, Earth's uh, surface. And um, in the Pacific Ocean, if you can see on the right there, there hardly any island or any land there. So these countries are just small, small thoughts. And uh, actually we have, my, um, you can divide those small, small Pacific Island nations into bigger three uh, divisions, Micronesia, Polynesia, and um, Melanesia. So I'm currently in Fiji, which is in Melanesia. And uh, next slide, please. Here, you know, you know, where the Pacific Islands are known for their, uh, uh, they are surrounded by a, a big body of water and they're known by their um, stunning uh, beauties and, and natural beauty. And next slide, please. Um, so these are just uh, pictures of my uh, uh, journey over all these different Pacific Island countries, uh, taking the moment there. Um, uh, these Pacific Island countries, they're basically, most of them are atolls. They're just uh, up to about the two meters high. The rest are volcanic islands. Um, their population wise, the total of about 9.9 uh, .9 million people and 75% are on one particular island country on the left, that's Papua New Guinea. Fiji, where I'm at, is about uh, uh, over 800,000 people. Next slide. So really, um, my journey in the gastroenterology world uh, began a long time ago when um, the founding fathers uh, on the left there, you can see Professor Finley McRae is the main uh, man there. There's uh, Dr. Malani and Dr. Toot, and uh, missing from there is uh, Professor Robert Moll. So they had this vision that the gastroenterology diseases in Fiji and the wider Pacific could be better managed with improved endoscopy services. 
and of course, improve knowledge and availability of cost-effective diagnostic and treatment options. Um, so there, the um, WGO recognized this and uh, basically helped us establish the 14th WGO training center in Fiji. And the main theme of the training at this site is skills transfer. Uh, uh, according to the Chinese proverb there, when you give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, you teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. So that's how we operate here at our training center here. We bring people to, um, uh, to train and then they go back to their sites, their hospitals or their countries to uh, deliver endoscopy there. Next slide, please. And so the challenge is for uh, anyone doing gastroenterology uh, in the Pacific Islands is really in the, you know, prior to WGO establishment back in 2008, um, you know, most of the gastroenterological diseases were, uh, especially if you have GI bleeding or any other um, conditions related to GI, they're mainly uh, looked after by surgeons and uh, most of the time, yeah, you know, in people's mind, only men can uh, do uh, the work of surgeons. Um, and also when it comes to gastroenterology, again, mostly men are doing the job there. So there's really lack of awareness. If there's any GI bleed, the cases go straight to surgeons. Um, and of course, we are limited by our resources. Uh, the equipment, consumables, and the manpower. Um, Geography-wise, uh, you noticed earlier that we are disposed, uh, sorry, dispersed uh, all over in the vast uh, Pacific Ocean. So um, not everybody have access to uh, endoscopy service. Um, so obviously we have diagnostic and interventional uh, skills uh, issues uh, and you have you know, you have to balance life, your family life with your career, uh, and it can be quite um, tasking. You have other competing issues. For me, uh, personally, my competing issues, you know, I'm in academia. Also, I do a lot, a lot of admin uh, work, and uh, I am part of our internal medicine organization of the Pacific. So uh, for the past more than nine years, I'm one of the... Um, board members and recently uh, uh, I'm the immediate, uh, pi uh, immediate president, immediate past president, sorry. Um, so like everybody else, the pandemic also uh, posed a big challenge for endoscopy service here in Fiji and everywhere else in the Pacific. Sustainability, that's a big issue. Obviously we are from low, uh, low, to middle income countries. And so, you know, issues with the uh, costly equipments, we rely a lot on uh, donated stuff and um, ICT hardware is also a big challenge. So despite that, over the years, uh, since uh, I started uh, being one of the trainees and eventually became a trainer, uh, you know, it may look uh, simple, but for us, it's a big uh, achievement when we're able to get to the terminal ileum with our endoscopy skills, and then you know able to uh, uh, recognize pathology much better. Because before the WGO center was established here, we were using fiber optic scopes, and you know how it is very difficult to be, uh, you know, seeing uh, pathology through this uh, eyepiece. Um, so having the video scopes really changed everything. And then of course, over the years, we learned to do more interventional skills, uh, basically uh, doing the uh, stenting and uh, glacier balloon dilatation, hemoclip placement, for foreign body removal. This may be bread and butter for, uh, you know, well-trained uh, gastroenterologists in the high developing, oh, sorry, high resource country, but not so for us in the low, uh, low and middle income countries. So next please. So I think personally for me, the success ingredients really 
Uh, I think what the, Dr. Regina just, just mentioned earlier, you know, resonates with me. You know, having that education and training opportunity and grab it, and uh, you know, hands-on endoscopy for me is really the way to go. Um, and having people to come and mentor you, and when when they're no longer here, you still keep that connection. Have the um, you know, instant messaging when you're you're in doubt or when you need help, email or if they can come to your country and uh, also uh, do in-country mentoring. I think that's a, a fantastic way of uh, keeping up the skills and um, sponsorship. That's very important. You know, it's important to practice in your own uh, area, but it's also important to go away and see how people are doing the things you're doing in your country and recognize your, uh, you know, your, uh, what you have and what you probably need to have more and uh, having the networks to help out. So, you know, making friends with your mentors or the net, those in your network and, you know, Grabbing the opportunity, seize the opportunity to go for conferences and uh, and and collaborate with others and develop friendship. I think friendship is very important. I think uh, most of the uh, my uh, success story is really based on the friendship I um, uh, develop with my mentors, uh, males or females, uh, whoever they are. Uh, you know, if they're experts in their areas, you know, it's good to have that friendship and uh, recognizing the limited resources you have means you have to cascade, you know, us in the Pacific, uh, you know, we just have to cascade. We have very limited resources, whatever we have, we just try to uh, move with that and uh, always strive for excellence. You know, I think you basically try to be the best you can be. And, you know, that's all you can do, just be the best you can be. And uh, having the support of family, that's very important. You know, I have uh, two uh, daughters and uh, without the help I get from family, friends, or, you know, it's hard to be uh, dedicated to your career uh, if you don't have that family support. And of course, your employers need to recognize that and really invest in you. That's very important. Uh, colleagues, they recognize if you're there all the time, like what the Dr. Regina said, you know, you're there, you know, be present. So you show that you are interested and you want to have the work done. So basically, my um, passion to serve, you know, is really getting things done, you know, uh, not uh, it, depending on others to do it for you. And so that also shows that you're, you want to be seen and uh, recognized that way. Um, and being a trainer, I think trainer helps uh, you improve in everything you do. That's the best way of learning too, when you become a trainer. Next slide. So with that uh, knowledge and skill, you know, I travel to other Pacific islands and, uh, you know, I help, uh, advocate and prom promote endoscopy service. Thank you. Wow, very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Maylin, for this lovely presentation, um, for highlighting the challenges in um, resource poor centers. Um, I can relate to that very well. So thank you very much. So um, I, there's a question here. What's your advice for young women today on being successful in life? Uh, yeah right right i think uh, the the most important thing is really you just have to be the author of your own life story you know i think uh, uh, you shouldn't uh, let others dictate to you you know you follow yeah. your dream your passion and uh, you know just remember that nothing is impossible you can do it if you really put your heart into it thank you Thank you very much. And a, there's another question. I'll take that um, now. How do you balance showing up and being also perceived as an ambitious woman in a male-dominated um, environment? So I'll, I, I'll take, I'd like Dr. Regina to take that, please. So how do you balance showing up 
and being also perceived as an ambitious woman in a male predominant environment. Where that um, can, yeah. That's a, that's a very difficult question. And I, I think that there is like, um, like a different way men are perceived when they are ambitious, they are considered career driven and intense and responsible even. And when women uh, act like that, I know that this has happened to me a lot in the in the workplace, uh, they are seen as aggressive, you know, and even that B word that we don't like, you know. Uh, so that is a very, very fine line where you can be assertive without being aggressive or being interpreted as aggressive and pushy. Um, I think that I'm not one to be girly. You know, I don't like to soften myself up in order to get what I want. But I do think that as women, uh, we we are still in a, in a moment in history where we do need to to walk that fine line. Uh, when is the the appropriate time to to be extremely assertive? Um, and where we're at in the ladder, I think, because it's different when you're trying to climb that ladder and you're trying to get up those steps. If you are extremely assertive you are gonna be interpreted as aggressive. So I think that you need to take your time and you need to pick your fights. You know, you pick your battles. Do I think that I'm in the right? And do I think that I can actually achieve what I'm looking for uh, versus am I just gonna get into this war with these people and I'm also not gonna be able to get what I'm looking for. And then it's just gonna be futile. Um, I think that we're not there yet. I would like to get Dr. Lara's opinion on this. Yeah. And how the male perspective is uh, on women on women that are extremely aggressive in the workplace. Because for me, it has been a setback. I am seen as an aggressive person. You know? so, Professor Luis? Yes, uh, th that's an excellent question. And you know what? Um, it, I think there are a bunch of uh, issues here. One of them is cultural. You know, in some cultures, um, it's a little bit more difficult. And females uh, are meant to you know, behave in a certain way, sadly, that's just the way it is. So we're not used to that. In other cultures, it's quite normal. And, you know, and thankfully, in other cultures, we now have more and more women in positional leadership. So it's not, it's not, it's not the exception anymore. Hopefully, yeah. it'll continue. So but I do think that you have to always be smart. And as you mentioned a little while ago, it's not that you're going to depend on a male, you're not going to depend on a savior, but find somebody who can sponsor you, not even mentor you, sponsor you. And that just takes you a long way. And I think you have to be deliberate about that. You have to actually be smart about this. You actually have to have a strategy because, you know, I'm sure you can be incredibly smart. But even males have to be a little bit difficult of, you know, when you start venturing into territory where somebody else is dominated, it's not going to be easy, whether you're a male or a female. And if you're a female, it becomes more difficult. There's no doubt about it. And sadly, you're correct. A male is driven, you know, um, uh, uh, is uh, is hardworking. And a female is like, hey, this is, should she be with our family? You know, it's horrible. But that's how people interpret things. And uh, yeah. so that's why you have to show up. You have to, you have to uh, try. You have to find your allies, uh, allies. And there are a bunch out there, believe me. Yeah. And you also don't, ha don't have to be afraid, as Dr. Previn said beautifully, right? You just have to be yourself. And mm -hmm. I think that'll carry you. That'll carry Look where you are. Look where you are, Dr. Ligoria. Look at all you've done, despite the fact that you think you uh, <laughs> you rub people the wrong way, you know, uh, you've gone a long way. So I think it can be done. And and also, you don't care. You just keep going. Don't care. If the person doesn't like you, who cares? I'll keep going. All right, I'll keep going. I'll take your advice on that. All right, so I think we lost um, Dr. Ganyet for a moment there. Um, we had some issues with her as well yesterday. We're going to wait for her to come back. But okay. while she comes back, oh, are you here? Are you back? Hello. Ah, uh, you're back. Okay, I'm so sorry about this. So, um, so the next speaker is Professor Nudan Tozan. So over to you, Professor Nudan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, shall I start? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is Nudan Tozan. Uh, I'm from Adjibadem 
Mehmet Ali Aydınlar University School of Medicine, Turkey, and I'm the chair of the GI department. Here you see my team where uh, there is a pretty good balance, gender balance, maybe a little bit more women than, than males. So I'm uh, delighted to be a speaker uh, this, uh, in the symposium, and I would like to thank WGO for inviting me. And my topic will be about the red lights. Uh, this is one of the topics which I like most. That means barriers and bias for women in academic gastroenterology. So uh, we all know that science culture is not uh, women friendly and there are male networks uh, in the academy, men help and support each other. So starting by the appointment in academic positions in GI, there are implicit and explicit bias on appointments to uh, academic positions. And women face difficulties when they apply to these positions and there's big competition with their male counterparts. And furthermore, they face difficulties in promotion to higher ranks, such as associate professorship or full professorship. And women are underrepresented on editorial boards of major medical journals. It doesn't mean that they don't volunteer to that, but according to the current literature, very few women figure out in, uh, as editors or as uh, vice editors or figure in the editorial boards. Um, and also there are fewer opportunities for female gastroenterologists to figure as a chair or speaker in prestigious GI meetings or lead the courses, especially the endoscopy courses, but it's getting more and more promising, especially in uh, American meetings, GI meetings, big meetings and European meetings. So uh, the future seems to be bright. Regarding the academic productivity, women have less authorship compared to men as primary author or senior author in high impact journals. And they have less um, acceptance of their papers in these journals. It was even worse during COVID pandemic because um, lots of um, responsibilities, uh, lots of assignments were hindering their academic productivity. Another, perhaps another hurdle was the lack of um, teamwork uh, the lack of allies for academic production. I think an, another um, hurdle is the uh, less opportunity for sponsorship, sponsorship for, uh, for uh, attending the meetings, sponsorship for obtaining grants for the research studies, uh, research uh, in, uh, in uh, abroad, in other countries. And they are less often awarded for these studies. And a good example is the Nobel Prize, which has been awarded only in 5.7% uh, for women in medicine. So I think we have a long way to go uh, in this matter. Can we have the next slide? Okay, how can we improve the sex disparity in academic medicine? Okay, we know that a journey of thousand miles begins with a single step. There are some, uh, maybe there's a need for implementation of some rules in academic institutions. First of all, each academic institution should try to cultivate a supportive work environment. Um, well, they have to, as I said, make some regulations, make implement some rules so that uh, each gender has the same opportunity uh, to work in a favorable environment. Institutional programs are necessary to support uh, women in academia. These may be special courses, these may be some research projects to work on. So institutions should have uh, to take some measures. This is not only the institution itself, it also involves the um, professional societies, it involves the um, decision makers, it is also related to uh, political parties. So I think the institutional programs have to be promoted which, because they are crucial for, uh, the, uh, for the progress of women in academia. 
I think one of the uh, one of the issues which has been tackled before is the help which is obtained from male colleagues. And both sexes should first admit that gender bias exists in academic gastroenterology. And male doctors should work in collaboration, in close collaboration with women counterparts for equity in academic medicine. Uh, this is not only a problem of uh, justice, but also a problem of uh, countries' uh, progression, uh, countries' progress, and economic values. Women should make an effort to involve themselves in research activities as early as possible in their careers. I think these five points are important uh, for uh, the solution of the problem. Uh, now, as an experienced gastroenterologist, not old, but experienced gastroenterologist, I would like to give some tips for success uh, of women in academic gastroenterology. First of all, there is the need of good mentors. Choose your mentor, whether it be female or male, to progress, to advance in your academic career. This is important to uh, have a role model to imitate or to emulate. Start your career early in life, uh, in research, in publications, in teaching, and a good doctor, whatever the branch is, has to learn constantly, incessantly, day and night. I think soft skills are also very important because the hard skills are necessary for having a good portfolio which is mandatory for admission to the institution and for promotion to high ranks, but communication skills, soft skills are also of uh, crucial uh, importance. So develop your soft skills, uh, whether you go to courses or you develop your inner core, develop yourself, um, dis discover your capabilities, discover your skills, your talents, that's important. Volunteer for being a faculty because, you know, on the way, some people are lost uh, at the uh, university, at the medical schools, at least half of the students are female. But over the years, they cannot compete with others. They cannot uh, maybe stand up to difficulties. Uh, they are um, submitted to mobbing. They are submitted to sexual uh, abuse. Uh, I think this is important because most of them, some of them are lost on the way. And this is uh, the leaky pipeline, the so-called leaky pipeline. So one has to overcome the imposter syndrome. One has to discover their qualities and learn how to serve on committees of professional societies. As said before, as beautifully phrased, volunteer for it and make it real. And to be successful, make a difference, show something different, uh, discover something different, make something different from others uh, so that you are visible. And finally, my last uh, maybe comment is be creative, competent and collaborative. These are the three C's which may render your life beautiful and successful. So patience is bitter, but it's fruit is sweet, as said by um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Northern, for the lovely presentation. That was excellent. And I'll still put that in my head. The three C's, be creative, be competent, and be collaborative. So we'll take the questions and answers after the last presentation by only male, our male allyship, Professor Luis Lara, please over to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ganyat and uh, uh, the WGO for allowing me this wonderful opportunity. I am really, really privileged to be here and uh, to be participating with everybody. Um, so my name is Luis Lara. I'm a professor of medicine here at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. And what I'm going to talk about <clears throat> is, is something that I think is highly important. What managers, managers being anybody who has a position of power, can do to change the fact that women, and certainly women of color, get less support at work. 
this is from a Harvard uh, Business Review. Next slide, please. So one thing to start off with is women want to be promoted. You know, women don't, at this day and age, they also want opportunities. Women have ambition, they have confidence, they have determination, and they have a desire. Most women of color want promotion and reach the top of their profession. However, numerous databases have shown us that, unfortunately, only about 4% of women and women of color occupy executive suite positions, despite similar education and success. Isn't that sad? For example, one um, uh, study from the Harvard Business School showed that of over 500 women who were graduates from that school, African-American women from that school, only 13% had achieved a high-ranking executive position compared to about 19% of African-American men who are also at disadvantage and about 40% of non-minority uh, um, non uh, alumni. It just shows you the tremendous disparity that exists. So the other important thing is this um, act of leaning in, going back to what Dr. Ligoria and, and, and Dr. Tozen uh, was mention were mentioning a little while ago, this act of leaning in, you know, act of a woman exerting herself in the workplace. Women have to do that to actually be noticed. Uh, and, uh, and women don't need to be told to do this. They want to be noticed. Women want to be noticed. So as a manager, what is potentially your, your role? Well, you have to understand a few things. You have to understand and accept this. There's no doubt about this. It's not invented. It's quite real. Women of, and women of color are more likely to suffer harassment, held to much higher standards than somebody who's very similar to them, sadly presumed to be less qualified compared to everybody else. So uh, that's um, um, there are my, there are microaggressions, there are double standards, unconscious bias, um, and uh, this, the, despite the fact that they have the same result as somebody who's different, uh, you know, who's who's not a woman, and definitely somebody who is not an underrepresented minority. Um, unfortunately, uh, they receive less support from their managers. They are less likely to have managers that promote their work that, and their contributions. And here, you have to think about some things that um, are real. The role of non-work activities. Most managers will end up um, you know, becoming friendly with people who are similar to them, just as they hire people who are similar to them, right? Males hire males, and uh, non-minorities hire non-minorities. And so it's important, this role of non-work activities, because this is important for networking, to getting to know each other. You know, just it can be simple as just meeting for coffee at the workplace or going out for dinner. Uh, there's a lack of mentorship and sponsorship. P the, the, the female, the woman, the underrepresented minority woman may lack um, uh, the, uh, the mentorship and sponsorship because of not seeking it, but also not being offered it. And, there, and keep in mind, managers who do this in many, many times, it's totally unconscious. They may think they're trying, they may think they're champions of diversity and equity and, uh, and inclusion, yet they're missing. And that's why it's so important to actually have this um, in mind and to be deliberate about this and to learn about this so you continue to improve yourself. Next slide, please. So these are the proposed six actions to help women of color advance. Some of this comes to the person themselves, but also it also comes to the administrator, the manager, the person who's in a position uh, uh, that can actually help out, right? Again, keep in mind, most people, most managers, when they look for employers or employees uh, or people to work with them, they, uh, they use the same rules that they use to pick their new friends, people like them people who have their similar life experiences, who look like them, who are the same sex. So um, it's human nature to have this bias. So you have to understand and accept that this is actually natural. So you actually have to fight against it, I guess, work against it. So taking initiative, right? You as, as, and, and everybody here has mentioned this, it's highly important for you also to take initiative, right? How do, can I be authentic, but also how can I assimilate? I mean, I don't like to go to bars and drink beer. So how can I assimilate with my male counterparts? Well, uh, you try to make uh, you know, connections at the workplace as much as you can, 
but the manager who hopefully has identified their own biases will actually make an effort to extend an invitation for that person to be present when it's appropriate. Now, uh, this issue about the Me Too cannot be movement cannot be used in, as an excuse, and it should not, because as long as the outreach is appropriate, even if it's personal, basically what you would do with any other team uh, team member, then it should be okay, and that and it's important uh, to socialize um, because uh, it does create different um, uh, levels of comfort that are also a way to. Um, to advance. Think about our national meetings. When we go to these meetings, like 80% of the meeting is socializing, meeting people, talking to people, you know, getting together with old friends and old colleagues. So this is an important aspect of going to meetings, which, you know, uh, COVID killed, unfortunately. The other one is give credit, give credit, give credit when it's due. It is very unfortunate, but women and definitely women of color and men of color, by the way, um, uh, 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 any other statements are usually uh, remembered less and less accurately than somebody else. So it's highly important for you to recognize that person who is contributing. So um, that person gets recognition, but also gets an opportunity. So it's very important for uh, the person to who 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 is managing anything, a, a conference, uh, a presentation, to make certain that the person who's contributing gets uh, singled out, gets recognized for their contribution. So when good work is being performed, that should be recognized. You should also provide honest feedback. It's sometimes perceived, you know, or people are afraid that they'll be perceived as misogynistic, racist, sexist, if you have feedback. But feedback is important because otherwise, how are you gonna improve yourself? So, you know, actually that mechanism is called protective hesitation, but that lack of candor will actually potentially squander somebody's career. So you, once you understand this, you can give positive feedback. You can give feedback that will make somebody better. You also have to assess the potential beyond competencies. You know, uh, again, uh, most of us, uh, we think that somebody will do a good job because they have certain characteristics, the ones that I identify with. But at the same time, how about that diamond in the rough? So you have to find ways to open up your eyes and pick somebody who actually may surprise you, right? And give them that opportunity. Because most people, especially at this level, you know, physicians, trained physicians, professors will do really well when given the opportunity. They just need it. They want it. Sometimes they'll be surprised by, by, by the opportunity, but most of the time they'll stand out. And you have to also, lastly, uh, you also have to check yourself for bias. Unfortunately, even though like in the U.S., this is a big thing and we're trying to work a little better, some better than others, I suppose, only a small number actually check for the compounding bias of race and gender. So if you're just looking for race and you're just looking for gender, but not for both, you're going to miss out on opportunities to improve yourself. So that everybody, everybody needs to keep this in mind so that we can work better. You can identify patients, people, I'm sorry, and you can identify better contributors and colleagues. And, ask, and, and lastly, ask why. Uh, they mentioned here, you know, the exit interviews, but hopefully this is before people leave you. You know, what's going on? Why don't, why don't people that I want to see rise, why don't they, why don't they rise? Maybe it's your, your mechanism. Maybe it's your own biases. Maybe it's the fact that, you know what, you're not identifying people and they walk out the door and you're losing amazing talent. So you have to find a way to um, ask why. You have to figure out, am I measuring what I need to measure so that I can take appropriate, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 um, whatever attitude so that things will get better for that person. So next slide, please. So um, one more slide, I think. Well, conclusion, I'm sorry. So women of color are motivated and engaged group of high potential future leaders. Companies, individuals, managers want to create more diverse and ultimately more successful teams need to do more to ensure that diverse female talent isn't left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Luis, for the lovely presentation. That was excellent. Um, so we will now have all the panelists. Um, we have some questions. So I'm going to start with the Q&A, and I'll throw it open. Um, so starting with um, Dr. Norden, um, what is your experience as endoscopist and mom? Oh. And a mother? <laughs> 
that's again a very difficult question <laughs> because you know this is also related to the environment you live the culture the uh maybe the population's bias and you know conception about women so um i was lucky because i had the very good parents which i didn't choose i had a wonderful husband who helped me a great to a great deal to me uh, for the for the kids i have only one uh, and uh, I was uh, very much attracted by endoscopy. Um, uh, that also needs uh, some, you know, uh, some skills, some uh, individual skills, and also courage because you have a great responsibility towards the patient, towards the family, and towards your institution. So I think this is a a matter of passion, a matter of attraction, and also. Um, uh, affability towards the patient. Uh, I think, um, uh, you know, the work-life balance is difficult for women because the uh, they work never ends, but uh, time management uh, is important. Uh, I have to confess that I have a, uh, I have a um, defect. I don't sleep in the night. I think this is the way I solve the problem. Maybe <laughs> most of the most of my colleagues do this. Uh, I'm uh, sleepless. Uh, this is the solution to the problem. Okay, Dr. Meili, what do you have to say to this? How 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 did you manage that? And then do and a mom, Dr. Meili. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. Uh, my my daughter. Um, tends to sing Rihanna's song, uh, work, 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 work. So that's how she <laughs> sees me. I'm working most of the time. And so I think it's very important to have someone in the background, who, whether it's your partner or nanny or anyone else that can help uh, look after your children while you're you know, uh, doing all the other uh, outside family work. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. And Thank Dr. You. Louis, um, yeah. a question to you. How can a male Caucasian manager with good intentions impact a female and especially an underrepresented female in the workplace? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know what, um, uh, the data definitely shows that uh, being a male and being a Caucasian male is an advantage. You you have advantages. They're built in. The system is like this. Whether you like to recognize it or not, that, that's the way it is. So it's virtually your responsibility to make certain that you bring others up. So you have to first recognize your biases. I already mentioned some of those. Yeah. Recognize that you're not a bad person for having them, by the way, but, you know, be a better person by, you know, trying to eliminate them. And you have to identify, Dr. Tosin mentioned a little while ago, include people, include people in your research, in your presentations. You know, at this point, many of us don't have to give major talks and we've done that already right so give the opportunity to somebody else right uh uh i i think you have to be very deliberate and intentional about this and i think it makes a huge difference when you do so because then that person will bring somebody else up and it'll just become a a train of gratitude and positivity so that's what i think that's how i think you need to do and if you're in a position to do so I think uh, you you need to. And can I comment on what when, was mentioned just a second ago? The other yes, thing, yes. Uh, I can't remember her name, but she's a very well-known IBD specialist from Mount Sinai here in New York. And she was mentioning about the fact of having children and people say, oh, she gets so much time off because she has a kid and you know, I'm a male, I don't get this time off or whatever. If you work 35 years of your life, think about how much of that time is going to you know, being pregnant and raising a kid, at least the initial years. It's a fraction of it. It's nothing. So we make a whole fuss at about a percentage of time that's actually quite minimal. So think about that. Thank you. And, and Regina, um, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about women compromising women. Do women also compromise the promotion of other women in academic institutions? What do you have to say to that? Uh, oof, that's a hard question. Um, sadly, I would have to say yes. I think that when we're looking for allies and we're, we're looking for, for collaborative work, we need to be aware that us as women many times hinder the progress of other women. It's been like so hard for us to, to get where we're at and it's been such a hurdle and we're still carrying all that baggage 
uh, of not being seen as aggressive and not being seen as stealing the spotlight from the men, that if we if we try to bring in our our, our, our other female colleagues into, into the positions of privilege or whatever you want to call them, we're afraid that we're going to be seen badly um, as trying to take over uh, the team. So I do think that as women, we're not necessarily the best advocates for other women. And that's a, and that is something that we need to work on. Uh, what Dr. Louise was talking about, about uh, also appreciating the work, uh, appreciating the potential, giving the praise. I've, I've had the experience sometimes that the, the only woman that's ahead of me <laughs> in the Guatemalan uh, profession as female GIs didn't give me those opportunities. And I think that I'm sometimes at fault uh, of not giving my younger female GIs other opportunities as well, or holding them, like Dr. Lara said, holding them to a higher standard uh, or, or being more um, exigente. I can't, find yeah. um, I can't find the word in English. Uh, <laughs> demanding more from them than, than maybe yeah. from a male student or a male fellow. Okay, I can see Dr. Nodan's hand up. So yeah, what do you have uh, to say? Yes, please. I find this question very interesting um, because if a female, for example, uh, seizes the opportunity of being the uh, the, he the head of uh, something <clears throat> or the um, has a, a position which is offered most often to males, uh, she feels sometimes to be threatened by other women. So uh, they compromise their work, they put obstacles on the promotion. This is very bad. Fortunately, it's not very frequent. It also depends on the environment, uh, on the culture has been stated. And this is called the Queen Bee Syndrome. Uh, and people under them suffer a lot. Uh, I have seen such experience in my country. Although there are few female leaders, some of them are very cruel, even more cruel than men. This is not for you, Louis. <laughs> Dr. Lara is shaking his head. Why are you shaking your head? Uh, it, it, it's sad to say, right? I mean, I, I could say the same of... Uh, some um, uh, males and uh, and and potentially even uh, ethnicities and and races, right? Um, uh, I'll share it. I mean, Hispanics uh, may, maybe uh, tend to do that a little bit too, actually. Even though you know, so uh, yeah. It, but but you have to be aware. You know, sometimes a person person may not be even aware they're doing it. Sometimes they need to be told you are. So yeah, yes. Yeah, so there've been some comments on the. Q and A uh, for working women. I believe if universities offer childcare um, starting early in the programs, that is during residences and fellowship, and for after school programs for older children of working women and men, there will be more options to work late and be present. So for committee meetings and all, yeah. So th these are very good um, comments. Um, another comment from. Um, and our heater, and um, we face many challenges and obstacles in our field that men do not have to deal with. And sometimes we're treated unfairly and disrespectfully. I think we've answered this and I can see um, Louise trying to respond. Yeah, so we'll wait to, to get a response from that. So as a final comment, um, I'll just go around. Maylene, what, what, uh, a final note before we wrap up? Uh, well, I think uh, you know, all the uh, presenters have, uh, have they have their messages, and you know I've learned a lot just listening to uh, uh, everyone. And uh, I think uh, it's important that for all of us, uh, all the women, and thanks to all the supportive men, I think we just really need to um, you know show our interest and and be committed. You know, and 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 just go for your passion. You know, um, like I said, just be the author of your life story. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. To, so I'd like to thank everyone, uh, to the presenters and organizers. Thank you for all your efforts to make the, this um, a success. And to the audience, we thank you for taking time to attend. Um, and also to remind you of the quarterly webinar series, do watch out for the September episode. Um, 
um, a recording of this webinar will be available at the World Gastroenterology website, so it's open for all to like have a look and download. An email with link will be sent to all registrants to participate in the survey. We would appreciate your participation. And as we conclude, um, I'd like to leave us with this quote. There's no force more powerful than a woman determined to rise. Thank you, everyone, and thanks for joining us. And have a good night, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, panelists. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.